Okay, so welcome everyone to the Small Business Brainstorm. This is a meeting of the minds. So we're all gonna chat through the state of being a business owner right now. Um, it's pretty clear that COVID-19 has changed all of our lives in the blink of an eye. And it's not just physically, it's socially, emotionally, and I think definitely financially, I think everyone has definitely felt that change. But in times of crisis, you know, when businesses are put to the test, I think it's been a great opportunity for all of us to really shift and reset and then respond to everything that's been happening. So I'm super excited to partner with MasterCard today for some real talk on how we can pivot confidently and securely with the tools and resources that we have available, but also really think about how we can move through this unprecedented time to come out of it and emerge even stronger than we were before. So excited to welcome all of you today. Sonia Rasula, the founder of Unique Markets. Um, Sarah Larson-Levy, founder and CEO of Y7 Studio. Tonya Bradley, entrepreneur and best-selling author. Paige Midland could not join us today, but Ginger Siegel, North America's small business lead of MasterCard. Welcome. Thank Hi. you. Hello. Great. So Sarah, I want to start off with you because yeah. a lot of our businesses have been through um, some challenges, I would say, in the last few months. And yeah. your business was in peak growth mode before this storm of COVID-19 hit. And I think it's fair to say that and you've been very transparent about it being a very emotional roller coaster for you. Um, and also financially, you actually went ahead and sent an email out to everyone on your database. And we're very transparent about how you've made the move to lay off 96% of your team. You are now a team of 12 and how you've cut those salaries as well. So I'd love to talk through that transparent approach, why you decided to lead that way and what the response has been from your community. Yeah, I, you know, it was, we've always kind of internally been really, really transparent with all of our teams about where we were at. And we felt it was important to let our clients know where we're at as a business. Um, I think especially in New York and LA where, you know, the bulk of our studios are, it is easy to overlook Y7 as a small business. Um, you know, we have 15 studios, we have quite a bit of reach and we've grown really, really fast. So we're not exactly your mom and pop, you know, studio with just one or two locations, but we're also not, you know, your yoga workers or powers who have, you know, multiple locations, other franchises, kind of a little bit more resources to rely on. So we felt it was really important to just be transparent with the people who have helped us become this successful of where we're at, what's going on, what our main focus is, and, you know, the reason behind the layoffs. I think it's really easy to be like, oh, well, they just, you know, they didn't manage their money well. Well, no, you know, it's not like, it's not just us that are in this position, but we have 15 landlords, you know, 16, if you want to include our office that are like, hey, where's my rent? Mm -hmm. We have, you know, back-end expenses um, with all of our operating systems that we still have to pay monthly fees on. And right now what we're doing is looking at our financials, looking at our balance sheets and making sure that, you know, hopefully when this is over, we have enough resources. So the second we open our doors, we can pay our employees, mm -hmm. we can pay our teams. What we're hoping to do is conserve enough now so that, you know, and the hardest part is, is there's no timeline. Mm -hmm. It's not like we can say, okay, we just need to save enough for eight weeks, yep. you know, so we can afford to keep on X, 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 and X as we kind of get through all this. We don't have a timeline. We don't know. So for us, it's like, we need to cut everything now so we can ride this out for nine months is where we put it at just to be safe. So, you know, we have to start payroll the second we open. We don't have time to kind of have that momentum and that build where we can slowly grow again we all of a sudden will have once again instead of having you know 10 to 20 employees and slowly growing there we'll have 300 again mm -hmm. and we'll have to pay those people so you know the intention of doing these layoffs early and we did them a little bit early because we also wanted to ensure that we had the cash to take care of them for a couple of weeks so we gave every single person on our team severance packages, um, you know, that were based on 
the, their amount of hours they worked, um, you know, in the beginning of January before this thing started to kind of take hold. Um, and then their tenure as well. So it was a lot of strategic moves on our part in order to take care of our people and also make sure that we can get through this and that, you know, they know that we, they will have jobs. Yeah. And lives so that when you do open, like to your point, there are jobs, there is capital to right. move forward um, in a strong way when everything goes. Yeah. Forward. It's tough. Cause there's two ways to look at it. It's like, well, we could keep everybody on and pay them for two months, but then there's no company and that's it. Yep. So it becomes this kind of, you know, push and pull and also, you know, helping to understand everybody where we're coming from as a business and we're doing our best to, you know, take care of the business and our people at the same time, which can be really tricky. Yeah, definitely. But you do um, have a business that has diversified, you know, you have the merch side of the business as well, where you kind of have the e-commerce side. Has that been a place where you've kind of jumped into a little bit to sort of supplement um, income income that was lost through the, the shuttering of the doors? Yeah, we're doing a lot of our e-com business is having one of its best months it's ever had, which yeah. is, which is, you know, bittersweet, I think. Um, but, you know, it also, we also run into complications on the supply side too of, you know, our factories open, we produce out of LA. So there are, you know, we have run into some restrictions with that. Um, a couple of our vendors have completely switched to only producing masks, which is incredible, you know, so it does leave us with limited resources to work on, but we're trying to keep, um, you know, keep focused on fun ways to engage our clientele, you know, with cute work from home outfits or, you know, and the work from home is, coincidentally and luckily enough is also the same um, lettering as we flow hard which is kind of our tagline so we've been able to play into that a little to still make people feel super connected to the community and that's you know been our main focus going forward is how do we you know continue to engage our community continue to let them know that you know we are still a safe space for them mm -hmm. we're a place that we can come to um you know and that had a lot to do with us launching digital as well yeah, and I want to touch on that a little later. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Sonia, I want to kind of chat through your business because as an events company, you had to kind of completely shut down everything as well. And you were also taking that leadership approach as, you know, in the same way as Sarah being very transparent about losing $250,000 like overnight, which, you know, for, no biz for any small business is no small amount of money. So can you talk through some of the challenges that you've faced and how you've been really open about them and why you took that business approach and what are some of the strategies that you've employed through this time to navigate it both financially and also emotionally as a business? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quite an interesting year. Um, I did the exact same thing that Sarah did, which was A, B, super transparent with my team from the very beginning. Um, I think that honest leadership is how I want to always be seen. And I think it's really important in companies in general, but right now, super important to be transparent and honest and also vulnerable with your team. Um, I too, so no one is working now. We are, everyone is officially furloughed. And for the same reasons that Sarah did it, we have to have money in the bank when this is finished, whenever that is. And so all my team agreed. Everyone wanted to stop working. They all wanted to know that they had jobs in the future. And I think that was really important. Um, yeah, I specialize in gathering thousands of people in spaces. <laughs> so unlike a lot of other business owners, the first week of March, I knew that my business was dead for 2020, for the entire year. Um, I don't know if we will be able to gather in large gatherings in 2021 even, to be perfectly honest. So I'm really paying attention to the government and the leadership there to help give me any sort of sign. But currently I and my team are pretty aware that events and gatherings are not gonna happen. So we are you know, kind of reacting fast, but we're trying to figure out ways to be virtual. And at this point, because my whole team pretty much is furloughed. 
they are still kind of doing some research and they're still answering emails and doing like light admin and they all want to do that voluntarily while furloughed which is really amazing i think it shows how passionate they are about the community that we serve which is small business owners so with unique markets we gather all of these business owners so that the public can come discover them and shop from them so what we're doing is we're, we're figuring out how to translate that into an online store ourselves mm -hmm. but of course as all of you know um, it takes a lot of power to get an online store up and running to get the product and now we're figuring out will we warehouse will we ship or will we have everyone drop ship so there's a lot of logistics that we're researching and looking at but i think our main goal of serving the small business community and trying mm -hmm. to trying to inspire people through creativity <coughs> Um, and innovation is really important. So we're, we're finding ways to do that online now instead of just in person. Was digital always part of the goal, do you think? <laughs> like in, on the back burner? <laughs> so it, I've had the company for 12 years, which is a really long time. I came from digital, so I was very specific when I started the company that I just wanted to get people off devices. Yes. <laughs> and I wanted them to interact one-on-one -on -one. um and so i think for many years i didn't want to go back mm -hmm. to digital and also there's lots of great people doing it so i think in my mind i was like this is what i'm good at we'll stick with this two years ago i thought about an online store i decided to franchise the company instead um and so now yes i'm thinking about digital <laughs> yeah no but i think even though there's more people I, you, to your point about there being other businesses like that already out there that are digital, I think your eye and the businesses that you curate together is something that no one else can do. Oh, thank you. So, I, I would tend to agree. <laughs> I'm excited by a unique markets on your Rasula website with all of those amazing places because it's, it's hard to discover new smaller businesses as well. Um, and if you can't physically go to that location, you know, in terms of gifting or buying new things for your house, I think it's also really nice to have it all there at one place online. So yeah. excited to hear more about that. Um, so Tonya, we touched on finance a little bit, but I know this is um, something that you're very um, experienced in, you know, and have worked with a lot of businesses. Um, and I think we've seen this be such a huge financial blow for small business in particular across the country. So I think right now they're looking for answers and we've seen a lot of them come to the site asking questions and, you know, we launched our Ask an Expert series to kind of really touch into that. But I'd love to know from your frame of mind and point of view, how businesses can really curb their spending right now. What are some things that they can do to cut back? Um, are there other financial strategies or tools that they can implement that can help them get through this time now so that they are a business on the other side of this? Yeah, you know, so um, I mean, outside of being an entrepreneur, when I started my company, MyFab Finance, one of the things that I said was, I have an understanding of personal finance, but not necessarily business finance. So in owning the company for the past five years, it really has forced me to become more comfortable managing business finances, which is completely different. It's a very different skill set, especially when you're paying people and responsible for livelihoods and so forth. And so I think that this, especially this what we're experiencing right now um it's requiring business owners to really focus on what's necessary in their business and when we sit back you know like these two ladies have said you know they had to cut their staff so that when this is over they not cut their staff but furlough their staff so that was, when this is over they're ready to go they're ready out the gate and it really is important for people to really look at the expenses that make sense and don't make sense at this point um ego play you know Ego plays a factor sometimes in some of our business decisions. I always say um, there's that that quote um, by Diddy. He's like, you know, don't let emotions don't pay the bills or like don't let your emotions make you broke. <laughs> um, and it, it's important because, you know, there might be things that you're holding on as a business owner that are mainly for your ego, but don't serve the survival of your business over the course of this pandemic, because we don't know how long this is going to be. We don't know how long this is going to echo and reverberate throughout our economy. And so really sitting down and separating your emotions from the facts and figuring out, okay, what makes sense right now? What doesn't make sense? And then asking yourself, where can I pivot? I'm so happy, you know, Sarah mentioned that, you know, merch is really taking off for them. And, and that's great because I think that 
even though this is an unfortunate experience for so many business owners, this is also an opportunity for them to see other areas in their business that could be strengthened, but they weren't previously paying attention to because something else was working for them. Um, and so now is the time to really pivot and really determine, okay, so should we focus on this? Should we focus on that? How, what are the other ways that we can get creative about bringing revenue into our business so that our basic needs are met? Um, so those, those are the really um, important things. It's like, okay, we can curb, but I always say that you can only cut spending so much before you have to figure out, okay, how are we going to replace this income? And so it is determining what a pivot may, means for you um, while authentically serving your audience, because that's important too, is you don't want to abandon your user base because you pivoted in a direction that doesn't resonate with them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that those are the things that entrepreneurs should be thinking about as they navigate the financial challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you think marketing is a place that they should put more money in or less money in right now? Like, what are your thoughts there? Uh, I think that largely depends on how they've connected with their audiences in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and that relationship, you know, this is where relationships really matter because people are having to choose where to spend their dollars and they're more likely to spend their dollars with a company or a brand that they have a relationship with than one they might not have a relationship with. Mm -hmm. So this is where, you know, marketing, maybe, you know, reaching out to that email list, you know, I think like Sonia, a great, you know, you, you have this community that you curated who loves your markets. And so reaching out to that list and saying, Hey, we've served you in this way in the past and we're looking forward to serving you in this way. People would be really excited about that because they love your concept and they love your product and your brand. But, for someone who like, it's, it's kind of like that text that you get from a guy that you're not really interested in anymore. It's like, Hey, it's like, Hey, <laughs> don't call me now. Um, it, it's like that. So you really want to be mindful in how you're marketing to your customers. Yeah, no, such great advice. I agree. Um, Ginger, speaking of financial support for small business, um, Mastercard is doing a really great job at helping small businesses sustain um, and get through this time right now. How do we build these crisis-proof companies? Is that possible? And how can we make sure that they're prepared for tough times like this in the future? And can you share some of the things Mastercard is doing? Yeah, you know, Sasha. The, the first thing is, you know, when you said, "How do we how do we build crisis-proof companies?" I think you do it by having women like these leading these companies. Um, because it, it takes every crisis and it turns it into an opportunity. Um, you know, COVID-19 is visibly impacting small businesses that are really central to our society and our economy. You know, I often think that people don't really understand that small businesses really represent 90% of all businesses and employ about 70% of all workers globally and deliver more than half of the GDP. So small business is big business. And what we're trying to do every day um, to really help all of the small businesses on the front lines is to take our current network, our insights, our technology, the different products and services that we bring to the table, the, some of the philanthropic support and the partnerships that we've um, that we bring on, such as Create and Cultivate, to make sure that we have the tools and the resources um, to actually serve the needs that are that are really needed to be met right now. So to begin with, um, a, a great announcement that we had um, probably two weeks ago is we've pledged $250 million in financial, technology, product, and insight support. Um, that's going to be over the next five years. And we've pledged it globally to small businesses to really support their financial security and viability. Um, we're also working with public sector entities like the IFC and private sector customers like Square, uh, Grameen USA, to really help unblock urgently needed capital. Um, and then we're also taking a look at ways to use our digital tools in order to connect marginalized communities to vital everyday services and marketplace. Um, I'm really excited. On May 5th, we're gonna be launching our small business COVID-19 command center. And this is basically gonna be a very complete web page that's gonna have digital resources with information 
links to all kinds of things to help in the current environment. And with, with our technology, we can bring all those things together in one. Is that we didn't just start this journey because of COVID. We have already been bringing on some really important tools and resources. So for example, thinking about people that don't want to touch a lot of paper. Um, for those people that are going in person to places, we found a way to digitize those papers and then upload that information into their accounting software. We also have a lot of contactless and e-commerce enablement which really can help businesses run at a social distance, which is critically important during this time. Also, card on file. Um, we know that small businesses will put their cards on files where you're not physically in front of them. And then lastly, things like zero liability, which lets small businesses enjoy kind of peace of mind and get some time back knowing that fraudulent transactions that may occur um, will be managed by their bank. So again, there's a lot of tools that we already had that we can reposition and really educate small businesses on the things that they might need today. Yeah, and you're so passionate about small business. What have been some of the amazing resilient stories that have really inspired you through this, this period of time where, you know, small business is a challenge. Like what are some of the stories that you're hearing? Yeah, you know. It, it's funny you ask that because, you know, I, I go to sleep every night and I say to myself, gosh, what, what, what have I really done? Because it's not me on the front line. But um, when I take a look, so there's a, a, we are really trying very hard to frequent some of the local establishments around our house because obviously being passionate about small business. Um, but there's a cute little restaurant, um, probably about five miles from my house. And we used to go there a lot in person and it is an in-person kind of place, but they have completely redefined themselves mm -hmm. and not only created a new menu for takeout, but they're also offering like 50% off bottles of wine because you know we know that liquor is a big thing. And so when you do your takeout, you can also take out not just the wine, but the cocktails that you used to get when you went there. Okay. And so I, it's just amazing to me just how people are redefining, you know, whether it's with Sarah or, you know, Sonia, just some of the redefinition of small businesses, it really puts me in awe um, of what they're able to do. Yeah, I love that. Um, and speaking of Sarah, you're about to launch in Chicago and there are a few new locations that were about to open up um, before all this happened. You were hiring new team members and then all of a sudden you were forced to close, but you didn't lose hope you've actually done a major pivot um, and taken everything digital. Can you talk us through that and some other exciting launches that you have coming up? Yeah, we actually got um, four days into our Chicago launch. So very successful from what we could tell. Yeah. Um, and you know, when all of this happened, it's, you know, we digital is something that I've been thinking about for years now, but we've been so focused, you know, it's like Tanya said, like, we haven't had the time to focus on these other aspects of our business because we've been so focused on opening and riding out that momentum. So, you know, I, for, you know, those, um, those watching who have been to Y7, it's, it's not an experience that's easy to recreate yes. in the home. <laughs> um, you know, it's hard to ask people to, okay, now we're going to turn off all the lights. You're going to turn your heat up. You're going to light some candles. You know, it's a lot when people are a lot of times turning to digital to get something, you know, quick and easy and accessible in their homes. So something that I've always known when we did decide to do digital was that I wasn't going to try to recreate that exact experience. It's just not, it will never live up to the in-person experience. So, you know, we've been doing a lot of due diligence just because you we wanted to make sure this was truly something that our clients were going to love while not trying to replace the thing that we do. And that's still kind of the attitude that we've taken with it now. Our timeline obviously sped up a lot, but, um, you know, the team that I have with me now is incredible. This is the team that I put in place to grow us from six studios to the 15. And it's the team that'll take us, you know, to 25 when this is done. So, this is my like A team, my powerhouse of a team. And 
my VP of marketing, I mean, basically didn't sleep um, for two weeks and got a digital platform up and running, um, you know, in two weeks, we got content filmed and we're just now in our third week today of launching Y7 online and we're learning We're you know, we've taken this opportunity to really say, hey, like we're not going anywhere. We still want to be here for you as clients and for our instructors. And it might not look as polished as it would have had we done it in a different time. But it's a, I think it's really interesting if, you know, I've had my moments of like mental breakdowns and, you know, sadness and frustration, but I think it's a really unique opportunity to launch something like this because the client is a little bit more forgiving if things aren't perfect. So we can experiment with a little bit of what if we do a restorative class? What if we do more of a 20 minute core focus series? Is that something that works? We have the opportunity to test that while still delivering, you know, the 60 minute we flow hard experience that we normally do in terms of class. So it's given us a little bit of wiggle room in terms of what we're doing because we are trying to serve, you know, such a range of clients right now with no access to studios. Um, I had a meeting today with my digital team and interestingly enough, one of our top videos is a five minute um, guided breathing exercise for anxiety, which isn't something, no one's coming to Y7, you know, learning how to breathe through anxiety. They're coming to sweat and to really work. Um, so I found that really interesting that that's something that people are gravitating towards. So it's really opened a lot of new doors for us and opportunity to, you know, understand what our client wants in more, maybe a little bit of a longer life cycle, not just sort of the physical studio presence. And I think it's really interesting too. You've always been connected to your customer and your community. I think like Y7 is the community. And I think that's why you're also doing so well in the digital space now, because you have this core community that just love everything you do and want to support that. And I think it's amazing how you've been able to lean on that now um, and really, you know, have them move through this experience with you, which must be pretty incredible. It's the response has blown us away. I did not think that, you know, because we're working, you know, we can't send people to a studio to record. We're not working with, you know, high end equipment, like we normally would, mm -hmm. you know, in a pre COVID universe. And it's, I'm just so I'm blown away by the support that our community has shown us. Yeah. I think that's why community is just so vital. It's like a lifeblood for a small business. Absolutely. And I think, you know, that's also why you have also seen such a great response to the way you've pivoted and moved as well, because I know that this has been a really tough time for you personally as well through everything that's happened, but you've chosen positivity and vulnerability, as you mentioned before. And rather than feeling hopeless, you launched a GoFundMe campaign and you mentioned on your Instagram how it kind of made you cringe to do it at first, but um, asking for help is something that I think as leaders, we don't necessarily think of doing. We think about strength and, you know, not showing that kind of weak, what we consider in society is a weaker side of ourselves, but as a small business and with a community that is so in touch with what you do and who you are, um, it's really been really vital for you to show that side. So why did you choose that? And um, how has it really helped your team and also you as an entrepreneur? Yeah, that that was a rough day for sure. Um, but it was also a very empowering one because honestly, um, I in 12 years, and you know already my story, I used my 401k to start the business. I've never once taken, taken any funding or taken a loan. So <laughs> for the first time in 12 years to admit that things weren't going to be great, um, you know, unlike a lot of other businesses who sell online and have merch, we don't, we literally didn't have anything to sell online. Our product is all the amazing small business owners and dreamers and, and entrepreneurs. That's our product. So I realized very quickly on that GoFundMe was probably a very good option because our community loves what we do. And, um, Everyone at that time, of course, was, I got probably no less than a thousand texts 
direct messages and emails saying like, have you heard of the PPP loans and have you investigated this and that? And that was also a really eye-opening thing because it showed me how much people cared, but it was also really hard as an owner. I don't know about everyone else listening to this right now, but having so many people um, you know, ask like, have I investigated all these different routes? And as a small business owner, yes, I had done that weeks before anyone else knew. Like, <laughs> you know, a diligent business owner is investigating things weeks before other people know, you know, we're, we're always 10 steps ahead. I think that's what's amazing about entrepreneurs. So um, I realized like, I'm probably not going to get one of the loans. Also, you know, I, I'm not really going to be able to hire my staff back full time because we, we don't have anything to work on. Like there's no large events that we are currently working on. So for me, GoFundMe was the best option. And as soon as I did it, I felt this weight like lift off of me. And the response from the community was so amazing. People were emailing me. People were donating large sums of money that I never would have ever have guessed. Um, you know, people donating hundreds at a time like this just blew my mind. So in a way it was, it was tough because of course I had to show my vulnerability, but I, again, take my role as a leader for the small business community really, really seriously. And I think that I wanted to make sure that everyone else out there also knew, like no one has their shit together. It's okay to admit that this is rough. It's a fucking global pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that we don't know how to run businesses. We're not good at accounting. It's like, this is a, a global health crisis. <laughs> so it was, it was rough, but in the end, I think it was a really good decision. And, um, it gave us a little bit of extra money to keep the team going for a little bit longer. And like I said, now we are furloughed and everyone is giving their time, which is really amazing because we have pivoted in some ways, which is, is yeah. cool. And I think as a leader as well, when you're at the top, it's, it can get lonely and it's not always easy to find someone to talk to. Are there anyone, you know, throughout this time that you have really sought out as a mentor or like, who are you leaning on right now for support? Honestly, uh, I usually text Jacqueline. <laughs> um, Jacqueline and I are both very similar. We oh, yeah, talked course. about this so many times. We don't really, neither of us really have official mentors. Um, and so I usually text my other small business owner friends. That's my lifeline. And we kind of bounce ideas back and forth. And um, they've kind of been my community right now. That makes sense. Um, speaking of the stimulus package, Tonya, um, you know, a lot of small businesses have relied on this for financial relief, but I don't think everyone has really been able to receive it. Um, so if cash is low right now, what are some things that people can do? Is it smart to turn to credit cards? What other kind of financial relief can they look into right now? Yeah. Um, I, you know, typically I am, so I'm not an anti credit card financial educator. I think that credit cards serve their purpose. I'm really happy that we built in both of my businesses, we built our lines of credit before this happened. Um, because it's nice to have that available. And, um, Absolutely. If you need to use credit to float your cash, like now is the time. If any, if any time, you know, that you're going to use credit, now is the time where you could say, okay, I'm going to give myself this runway and I have the cre this line of credit available to me. I will put this item on credit or put this inventory on credit and so forth so that I can ensure that I have cash to make day-to-day -day, um, purchases or just the things that might come up that aren't um, eligible for credit card purchases or they won't accept credit absolutely like be kind to yourself be gentle to yourself now is not the time to say like credit is the enemy and so forth and like sonia you know i bootstrap my my first business my fab finance i started in my brooklyn bedroom when i started it and then the company i recently acquired last year club lupa um it's i purchased it with money that i had put aside and saved and so for me you know i definitely value that like it's my money but in the same sense sometimes you need a hand and um, that hand could be in the form of a line of credit available to you or credit cards you have. Maybe you don't have business credit. Maybe this is the time to use your personal credit. Just be mindful of how you're utilizing that and having a plan for paying it off. Mm -hmm. um, I know that it could be tempting during this time, but I always say, like, just have a plan. 
for how you're going to pay it down, how you're going to pay it back. Because one of the biggest things that gets people in trouble is they use their credit without having a plan of how or a course of action of how they're going to um, pay that debt down or pay it off or they move on to the next thing. So they use, you know, they use their credit on this and they move to the next thing. So just be mindful of how you're using it. I always say a credit card is not the gap between your ideal life and your actual life. It is to kind of make up that difference between your needs at that, at that time and what you have available to fund your needs. So yes, um, just recently did a project with a company that um, is, you know, wanted people to be aware of getting in line when funds were reallocated to the Paycheck Protection Program and funds were reallocated to it. Actually, one of my businesses did receive money. Uh, we didn't receive it the first round, but we received it the second round. And so just paying attention to legislation, paying attention to what's going on and put, positioning yourself and getting in line if there's going to be funding available. Maybe you don't receive money that first wave, but you might receive it the second wave. I see this going on for a long period of time. I don't know how much money the government is going to have to keep. I'm like, where did they find this? I really was like, so they just had where's this money coming from? Yeah. Um, and, but you, you know, they're finding it. And so maybe there is going to be a third or fourth wave of this and having your books in order and everything else. Maybe you didn't have your taxes or your books in order the first round and you want to make sure that you have it in order the next time that funding becomes available. Also paying attention to your local landscape because maybe, rec maybe needs or requirements from your local jurisdictions won't be as stringent as the federal requirements. And also maybe they're a little more lenient. Maybe the federal requirements are like, you know, okay, you have to have this, this, this. And maybe your local government is like, you just have to have made a difference in the lives of our local community. You know, so paying attention to what's available locally um, and not counting yourself out for that, putting your, your hat in the pot. Because as a financial educator, I am also very spiritual. Even my meditation today was about receiving and being open to receiving. Like Sonia, that was big to create a GoFundMe and being open to receiving. As people who, business owners, we give so much that we aren't often open to receiving and like realizing that people want to give back to us too. So opening yourself up to be given to or to receive from your community is really important and could be an alternative source of funding during this time. I love that so much. I think that that relates to so many other facets as well. And there are other things too, like Spanx, um, the founder was giving away grants. Um, there's a lot of other things to keep your eye out on as well as different kind of grants popping up all over the place that you can apply for. Um, and Money Moves are giving away $10,000 to a small business owner as well. So very exciting. Um, so Ginger, businesses, small businesses right now are pivoting quickly and that's really great. But as Sonia mentioned, it takes a lot of resources, you know, and sometimes a lot of funds and a team, you know, and if you've had to furlough them, that can be an issue. And also there's a lot of technology involved in pivoting to digital as well. What advice can you share for small businesses who are going through this right now? Um, where they want to kind of make the most of this online digital pivot, but they don't have the resources to, to do that. Yeah, that's a great question, Session. It really is amazing the number of small businesses that did not have an online digital presence. So that's really important to us as we continue to look at ways to help. And one of the other interesting facts related to online is that a lot of the cyber threats and cyber attacks that have been happening are really happening to small business. And as small businesses continue to transform kind of from Main Street to digital Main Street, they really have to keep their businesses and their employees and themselves protected. Um, and as I mentioned, one of the things that we're seeing the most is, regard, is, is in regards to cyber threats. So one of the things we recently announced, which, which I'm really proud of, is that we're going to be offering free cyber vulnerability assessments and identity theft protection to the nation's 28 million small businesses, as well as their 57 million employees. Um, and this is going to really not only help small businesses understand the vulnerabilities in their system, but also with resolution. And look, we know small businesses don't have resources. They don't have staff. And especially as you've heard from these amazing women having to furlough staff. So we're going to help them and partner with them to help prioritize the issues that need to be fixed first and then repair any critical vulnerabilities. And so in addition to cyber, though, 
and you've heard it, obviously cash flow was one of the biggest issues. We know that the uh, the first round of PPP money went very quickly and the 310 billion that was just announced could easily be gone you know, in the next couple of days. And so anything we can do to help small businesses manage their cash flow, track their income and expenses, and actually send invoices digitally versus through the mail, um, we want to help with. So we've partnered with Intuit um, to provide big discounts on QuickBooks um, as well as TurboTax for those people that use our card. And we think that now more than ever, this type of accounting software and management um, digitally is going to be really important to help businesses um, survive this and pivot. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. I've, I've seen it myself just with smaller sort of threats and a lot of people really reporting fraud and different kind of cases of that online at the moment. So I think it's a really smart move on MasterCard's behalf. And I think a lot of people are really looking for that protection right now. Yep. So Sonia, we know that there's this digital pivot, that content is critical right now. It's not that it ever wasn't, but it is more now than ever. Um, how can brands pivot their strategy? What kind of content is resonating right now? I know you've been doing a lot of IG lives and kind of capitalizing on that trend at the moment. Um, how have you kind of adjusted your content calendar and what advice can you share? Yeah, so uh, we did not have a content calendar really. <laughs> um, you know, we are strong on Instagram. Again, I come from a tech social media background. So ironically, I should have had a content calendar. Um, but I think what we did was we implemented a kind of an Instagram strategy, which was me going online every single day to do a live, which six weeks into it was exhausting. I did not understand how long a trajectory we were dealing with. So I now do weekly IG lives. Um, but I think that there are so many ways that people can serve their community when it comes to content. So usually when we say content, everyone thinks like blog or like writing or something that takes a lot of time and energy. And for me, especially with small business owners and makers, I think that it's thinking about social media. For me, the biggest thing is Instagram right now. Like Instagram, Facebook, maybe TikTok. If you're like 20, I don't know. Um, yeah. But creating content that serves your community, I think is going to bring you back tenfold in the long run. So I'm still seeing a lot of brands like doing the hard sell. And I think right now you need to think about social media more in a content perspective, not in a selling shopping perspective. So talking about your story, how you make the products, mm -hmm. um, getting over yourself and actually doing like an IG live or, or flipping the camera around and showing people the materials and all the steps it takes to make wow. one necklace. Like to me, content is about having a conversation and letting people enter your world really. Yeah. So I think that it's just flipping the idea of um, using social media to sell and instead have a conversation create content that's captivating and people will naturally because of that buy. They're, they're going to want to support you. We've talked about it already today. Your community will have your back. So I think that if you think about creating a calendar and being realistic with your time, so realistic was not me going live every single day. Also, I ran out of makeup really quick. I never wear makeup. And I was like, I only had one powder and I used it every day for six weeks straight. And I, was like, I don't know what to do now. So I think it's figuring out a strategy that's realistic time-wise. And for me, email marketing, it, like everyone always thinks sending emails is really like weird. And I'm sure Sarah can attest to this, that email that you sent for Y7, like email to me is the most amazing avenue because people have asked to hear from you and there's no algorithm that's stopping your email from getting their inbox. So for me, people tend to not think of email as content. It's absolutely content. So I think you have to stay in touch with your audience and email for me is a really good way to do it. I last month started a weekly small business newsletter and not to get like too cheesy with numbers, but it has a 37% open rate, which is massive. Mm -hmm. And I, I just realized that like people are desperate for real content and real voices. So I'm really proud of the fact that we kind of figure that out quickly and are putting it out there. 
Well, I had email and newsletter. I wrote it down as you were saying it because I agree a thousand percent because that is your core customer. They have signed up, they're in, they're like opting in for your content. So they're the people that are there. They're already ready, primed to buy. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a really, really smart move. And I think, you know, it's not too late if you don't have a newsletter or some kind of email marketing campaign to really think about it now. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people are very mindful of their inbox because they're online more and they're going, oh, I don't, I want to unsubscribe from all these things that I didn't realize I had and just really, really focusing on the things that they want in their inbound. <laughs> so really, really smart advice. Um, Sarah, you mentioned in your founder email that you're finding the light in the darkness and it's not just a Y7 anthem, which I thought was really beautiful. Um, and that this moment is really about how we choose to approach times of extreme adversity. So I'd love to know how you're personally finding the light um, right now, because I think a lot of other small business owners who are listening today are going through those personal challenges too. So what's inspiring you and motivating you and keeping your emotional engine running? <laughs> it, it's a lot. And I think, you know, Tanya and Sonia both hit on this, that it's really, it's lonely up here. <laughs> when you own a business and you don't, you know, you don't have the coworker that you can like bitch to for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. You don't get to do that. You don't get to have a meltdown, mm -hmm. you know, over like an email and emotionally react to it. You don't get to do that because it's just not where you sit. And especially in times like this, it's our responsibility to kind of be the ones who are level-headed. Like we cannot lose it. I lose it, you know, my poor husband is like, are, are you okay? Like, you're gonna make, you're gonna make it through this. Um, but it's, it, it's a lot. And I think, you know, what has been keeping me going is really, you know, seeing the motivation from my team. Um, and, you know, we made pretty, we made big salary cuts. We cut my leadership team pretty significantly across the board. Um, you know, and their workload has, not gotten smaller with that cut certainly um and just knowing that everyone is still here for it and you know knows that this is a time that we just have to get through mm -hmm. and what we do now is going to set us up for success in the future so it's you know it's reminding myself that that is where i sit that i have it's my words it's my attitude that is going to propel that forward so for me it's just you know continuing to remind myself that that has to i have to be that light i have to continue to be that person because if i don't do it a lot more is at risk than just me you know venting for 10 minutes and holding something in you know it's the company it's it's how we're choosing to move forward how we're thinking innovatively and not kind of giving up if something doesn't go our way or getting really frustrated. It's how are we becoming better leaders in this space? What are we learning? You know, my ops team right now is looking back at the last 10 openings we did yep. and going through all those numbers right now. How can we open better? How can we open smarter? How can we schedule better? How can we, we rework roles within the team for when we do open, we're being the most efficient that we can be. So, you know, it's making sure that, you know, the tasks that people are given to are also making a difference in the company and not just like, Hey, can you order this thing for me? You know, sort of busy work. So it's making sure that everything is really intentional and that there's, you know, there's a purpose. And I think that's kind of what our light continues to be is that purpose. And it changes, things change. I, you know, have had not great days, but I feel very lucky that I still have a business. And I have to focus on that. Yeah, that's really inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing. Appreciate it so much. Um, Tonya, it's not just small businesses that are feeling the pinch right now. It's across the board. Um, and I think a lot of big businesses and small businesses have seen shipping orders come to a halt. You know, production um, has really been affected. Sarah, you mentioned about supply chain manufacturers you know you think oh great go to e-commerce but then you know you've got all these other issues with your supply chain and your manufacturing that make a huge impact on how you can create revenue right now so how can small businesses and designers 
um, get ahead of that right now. Like, especially if you're supplying a big retail store and they're not buying and they're canceling their fall orders and things like that. Um, how can they kind of get ahead of that? What other things can they think through to make sure that they get through this time? Yeah, I mean, diversification, diversification and investing. Diversification is one of the important things that safeguards your portfolio. Diversification is also what can safeguard your business. And so by putting all the eggs in one basket and having just one buyer, you're, you're incredibly vulnerable pandemic or not, because um, at any given moment, they can come to you and undercut the pricing or decide that, you know, your product isn't, they're not, they no longer want to purchase your product. Um, so it, this is an opportunity to, buy, to diversify your customer base to look for other needs in the market, maybe to look at a, um, a fulfilled by Amazon arrangement, you know, maybe look at just different ways that you can get your product in the hands of consumers, other than relying on one particular avenue to do that. Um, and the same goes for individuals who have supply needs. You know, one of my companies we source, from, and my, my other company we source from a supplier here in the States, but we also source from quite a few companies in Asia and- yeah. We aren't getting things, you know, um, and so it is looking for other avenues. Um, it's but in, at this time, you know, you don't want to increase the cost of the, the goods that you're purchasing, but maybe it's something that you just have to do in the moment by going with a manufacturer that has, hasn't been burdened by this pandemic or hasn't experienced issues with their own supply chains. So that, but then also communicating. Um, if you're having issues sourcing products and so forth, being transparent and communicating with your community, like this is why this is happening. We won't be able to stop this for a while because of this. Can we offer you a different option? Is there something else that we can do um, rather than going radio silent? Um, because then that allows you to get ahead of that with your, your customers and they'll respect that a lot more. And uh, I was talking to some, um, some of my community members. And one of the things I was telling them that this is probably the most understanding time period that we all will experience when it comes to be, it comes to humanity, because we're all experiencing this together and we're seeing how it's impacting everyone and really not taking advantage of it, but understanding that now and using that as you communicate and are transparent with your audiences because people get it. They understand like, no, duh, you couldn't get your product in this month because uh, you know, they've cut, um, the, the, Planes aren't, you know, they cut plane routes or, you know, people aren't able to go to the office and they're short staffed or factories are short staffed and so forth. So really leaning into that opportunity to be transparent with what's going on, talking about content creation, that's a piece of content and really peeling the lid back on your business and letting people know what's going on. Um, but then also ask polling your audience. And, you know, I think there's power in transparency and letting your audience know what's going on, because then maybe you might have someone in your audience who's a buyer for a company, or maybe they know someone who might be able to, you know, pick up some of that inventory that you have on hand that your largest buyer wasn't able to. And so th just, uh, there's, there's power and transparency and also opportunity in it as well. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, and speaking of community, Ginger, you know, we've spoken a lot about it today and how much small businesses kind of are built on the foundation of community and really rely on them, whether it's the email audience, the social audience, the in real life audience, you know, that community that we have that rally around us is so essential. It's like a direct line. Um, so what tools and sources are available to help small business owners, you know, pivot their operations and really drive effective business strategy throughout this crisis right now? Yeah, Sasha, it's a great question. And, you know, you think about community in a couple different ways. You think about it as the community where your business is. You think about it as the community of people that you surround yourself with to give you that support. Um, and then you also think about community in terms of your customers. And one of the things that we know that businesses are suffering from is having enough data to really understand what's happening around them. And so we're gonna be providing um, another free item, piece of our technology called local market intelligence, which is gonna actually provide small businesses with like store level metrics, including what people are spending there, um, the percentage of new customers, the percentage of repeat customers. This is data that small businesses normally wouldn't get, but it really can help them make the right decisions um, for the right time. The other thing is, is you know, what we know, and I think um, the community that Create and Cultivate um, has really 
brought together is this concept of mentorship. And um, earlier in March, we launched um, Her Ideas Community with, in partnership with Hello Alice. Um, it's really going to be de dedicated to delivering a digital platform, which is going to provide a lot of networking opportunities, which we know is absolutely critical. And as part of that, um, in order to celebrate Small Business Month, because boy, do we need to celebrate Small Business Month this year, um, we're launching an ongoing online mentorship program where we're actually going to take um, members of our Women Business Advisory Council um, and actually have them partner with external experts to curate a weekly calendar, kind of what Sonia was saying, just a calendar of different small business engagements, um, which is going to be live on Her Ideas community and influencer channels. And then throughout the programming, um, members will be able to connect with these experts every week in May to ask them questions about, you know, get personal responses and guidance. And then what's exciting is those experts will then join Jacqueline, um, who we all know and love, on a weekly live Instagram session to really talk the talk and bring those questions to bear. So all of this is really in support of our Path to Priceless initiative, which is aimed at how do we connect women business owners to other resources, tools, and other um, business owners that can really provide them with the mentorship. And so we really look forward to working with our partners like you, with like Hello Alice, in order to create these connections, which I can absolutely confirm are needed now more than ever. Definitely. And I think it's so important too to have those free tools and that access to the experts. Um, we found that that's been, you know, having that direct line has been the most, um, you know, really amazing tool for our community and for small business owners in those early stages and beyond. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I don't want to predict the future, but I do think that it would be nice for all of us to kind of give a little bit of insight on where we think things are going um, post pandemic. What changes do you think are in store um, for small business and, and for the country right now? <laughs> everyone. Oh, everyone. Yeah, everyone can answer this one. I can, I can go first. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, what do we do? Um, it's interesting. So I started the company in 2008, which was the last recession. Um, and it was born out of this need for thinking that people should be off their devices. So there's a whole world out there that is going to jump to be a virtual and pivot. And I think that's great. We are on board with that. We launched a Mother's Day online pop-up shop that's virtual, which we've never done. Um, however, I believe that this is going to show people, especially in North America, I think it's going to have everyone think about what is very important to them. And I think it's cutting out a lot of the noise and the BS in all of our lives. Like I've started FaceTiming with my parents. I've never video timed with them ever. Um, they follow me on Instagram now and comment. Like it, it's, we're, we're interacting with everyone differently virtually, which is great. But I believe that people like Sarah and studios like Y7 and events like Unique Markets and museums and food festivals and movie theaters, I really believe that once we are allowed to kind of go back to whatever that normal is going to be, I think people are going to value experience even more. And I, I don't think enough people were valuing it mm -hmm. before. I think the idea of knowing where your food is coming from, knowing the people who make the things that you mm -hmm. cherish and bring into your life, buying quality over quantity, I started the company with that saying 12 years ago, and I actually believe that the whole world, not just Americans now, are going to really embrace that even more. So I think, for me, I think there will be a, a fast trend for the next year or two, which is virtual, virtual, virtual. But I do think that the value of meeting people in person and giving people hugs and handshakes and um, supporting the local restaurants, the local yoga studios, the local makers. I think that's going to be really important in the future. I agree. Sustainability. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I'll just I, I'll just jump in on because I think Sonia just nailed it. And you know, I I was thinking about this. So every day you walk down the street and you see people, whether they're going to their job or coming from their job or going to a restaurant. I don't think we as humans ever fully appreciated what other people did during their day. And just as evidenced, I know um, I was just talking to one of my team members that live in the city and every night at 7 p.m., people are looking out their windows and clapping for healthcare workers. Um, every day, people are talking about small business and what it means that that restaurant or that plumber is being impacted. So I believe when we come out of this, aside from the fact that we are really going to appreciate you know, um, having a glass of wine in person yeah. versus just virtually, we're going to truly appreciate the contributions that people make to our lives and not take a lot of that for granted. Um, and I'm, I'm really, I, I hate to say this, but this has been a, an horrible crisis for small business. But I know that the visibility of small business and what, for example, all these wonderful women do for a living and the companies they run, I think that's going to really increase. Mm -hmm. And, and it's going to be at least my mission to make sure it stays there. Oh, thanks, Ginger. <laughs> I don't have anything like that much more to add. I, I think it's going to be, you know, from where I, I sit in terms of, you know, fitness and being such a physical business, I think we are going to see a Rio Sonia. There's going to be a huge like upswing of digital and virtual things so people can still connect. And while we kind of figure out what this new normal looks like, but I also think when we are allowed back outside, like something that I think about and that I've always been really hard on my team about, especially my studio teams, is that you need to look up when people come in. Yep. You know, a yep. lot of times we're running these peak time check-ins. It's like, hi, what's your name? Do you need mat and towel? And it's a very quick interaction. And it's something I've always said. I was like, people can spend their money anywhere. Mm -hmm. It is their time that is going to be the most important thing. Mm -hmm. that we need to look at like it's not just the 25 dollars people are paying for class they're spending you know 20 30 minutes however long the commute is to get there mm -hmm. they're getting there on time which you know in new york is asking everyone to get there early same thing with la and <laughs> it's like if you're on time you are early there so we're asking people to get there early they're spending an hour of their time with us that they could be doing anything else with and those little human interactions of making eye contact, saying hello, how are you, and acknowledgement are going to be so much more important and I think appreciated now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just close off on that. I think that um, self care and angles related to self care are going to be um, extremely important in the aftermath of this because we're seeing the impact it's having on healthcare workers. Um, it, people who might not have even identified as having a mental health related, um, condition are like, okay, I have anxiety for the first time in my life. How do I manage this? Or now I have a phobia of going outside or going to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Um, I always, I laugh at my friend and say, I'm going to be like a grandparent and my kids are going to, my grandkids are going to be like, she lived through COVID-19. <laughs> everything. Um. But I also think that it is, you know, self-care is going to become very important. I think a lot of the studies are going to come out of this about people who um, survived. It was because um, of a myriad of factors, but we're already seeing, you know, health, health going into this also matters. And so people really yeah. will want to fortify their mental and physical health. Um, and so that they're protected against, you know, pr potentially something else that could happen. Um, so I think that, you know, as companies, as business owners, we have to think about what does self-care look like for our company and how are we contributing to the wellness of individuals? It becomes our responsibility to help take care of the people that we serve. I agree. thousand percent. So I'm going to finish up with some rapid fire questions. Um, when I'm feeling fear, I dot, dot, dot. Cook or play with my dogs. Yeah, cooking's a good one. I question the fear question the fear and ask whose fear is this? Is it mine or is it something around me? Yes. Love it. I ask if it's real or not. Mm. I just keep pushing forward. I um I tend to just like look fear right in the eyes and just like turn the other way. I don't give it any <laughs> zero time. <laughs> um my priceless money tip for small business is 
nowhere it's going. Oh, sorry. Oh no, I just said know where it's going. <laughs> and I'll add, always have more than you think you'll need. Mm -hmm. yeah. Be mindful that what you're buying is really needed at the time. Mm -hmm. I'd say be swifty. <laughs> You really need the fancy pen. <laughs> um, and COVID nineteen has taught me um, that I can only control my reaction. Mm -hmm. That looks are only skin deep. That. I have been able to accomplish a lot over the last month and haven't been looking so hot. So <laughs> it's okay sometimes. <laughs> Thanks. Exactly. <laughs> I would say that um, probably reaffirming my belief that small business owners are superstars. Yeah. <laughs> and I would say life is more flexible than we believe it is because we've all bent to this new reality. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then success now is coming out on the other side, strong and smiling. Yeah, smiling is a good one. <laughs> I think it's the same for me as what it was before, which is success is being happy, being proud of what you do. And for me right now, it looks like surviving. Yeah. And I'd have to, I'd have to echo um, Sonia's success for me is um, doing things how I, you know, how I plan to or how I wanted to or the best way possible and being happy about that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. This has been so informative and I know our community will get so much out of all of your advice. Um, I wish you all the best of luck and stay in touch. Thanks, thank Sasha. Thank you. Bye, everyone.